If you have your Bibles with you, go right to the Word of the Lord this morning. We're going to read from the book of Genesis, chapter 32, starting at verse 22. We'll read down through verse 28. The Scripture says, And he rose up that night, and took his two wives, and his two women servants, and his eleven sons, and passed over the ford Jabbok. And he took them and sent them over the brook and sent them over that he had. And Jacob was left alone and there wrestled a man with him until the breaking of the day. And when he saw that he prevailed not against him, he touched the hollow of his thigh and the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint and he wrestled with him. And he said, Let me go, for the day breaketh. And he said, I will not let thee go, except thou bless me. And he said unto him, What is thy name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, Thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel. For as a prince hast thou power with God and with men, and hast prevailed. I want to preach for a few minutes this morning. God can't bless them there. And the, the inflict, infliction of the words is kind of tricky because we're going to touch on two things. So it's God can't bless them there, and it's also God can't bless them there. So that'll make sense a little bit better here in a few minutes. Let's lift our voices and pray one more time that God would have his way. Lord, we thank you for who you are. Thank you for the power of your word and all that it is that you're doing. We give you glory for every testimony that's represented here this morning. We ask you to have your way in this service. This is your time. This is your word and we're your people. God, we want to have you move and minister in a way that only you can. We ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen. You can be seated. The scripture that we read here talks about a man by the name of Jacob, and Jacob's tone of his life was set at his birth. The, the Bible tells us that as he was born, him and his twin brother Esau, that, that as Esau was born first, Jacob had, he had a hold on his brother. I believe it says he, his, he had his hand wrapped around his heel. He, he wanted to be first. He wanted to be blessed. His very name, Jacob, would become known as the deceiver, the supplanter. He was the, he was the schemer. He was the guy that always had something going on. He was always working a deal. He was always trying to figure out a way to, to get himself ahead. His desire for greater blessing one day met opportunity as his brother, the firstborn, comes in from the field. He's been out hunting. Many of us know the story, but I, I don't want to pass over things. He comes in from the field. He, he's, he's hungry. He rightfully has a, a biblical blessing that's going to come upon him. And he, he says, oh, Jacob, man, you got some food there. I'm starving. And Jacob says, I can help you out with that. I've got, I've got a fresh bowl of beans and you can have it. All you got to do is, is trade me your birthright. And so, so he schemes, he works out, and his, his foolish brother must have been really, really hungry or really, really stupid because he took the deal. And, and that, was, that was his fault, but Jacob, Jacob took advantage of that. Later, with the coaching of his mom, he allows his desire for more to lead him into deceiving his own father. And when the time came, his father was getting ready to pass off the scene. He called for Esau so that he could lay his hands on him and pronounce a blessing on his life. And his mother went and got Jacob and, and they crafted goat skins and they put it on his arm. And they wanted to make him appear like, like Esau because his father was old in age. He couldn't see well. And he comes in and he says, here it is, dad. I'm, I'm Esau. I'm ready to be blessed. And his, his dad says, man, it doesn't sound like. Esau. No, no, it's me. It's me. And so there again, he, he schemes this plan and he, he takes what isn't his. He takes a blessing. He, he receives something that doesn't, doesn't really belong to him. And of course, his brother wanted to kill him. Anybody have siblings? Okay, you can understand. But his brother really wanted to kill him. First, you tricked me out of my birthright. Now you, you slip in and you steal my blessing. 
You could see why Jacob was known as the deceiver, the schemer, the, the trickster. So Jacob flees. He, he's at least smart enough to realize, okay, I can't talk my way out of this one. I'm, I'm out of here. He leaves. And now in these verses that we read, we see God dealing with Jacob and telling him it's time for him to go back. It's time for him to go back. But he knows Esau's still there. He knows Esau still wants to kill him. Esau still doesn't like him. And, and we see this exchange take place. He's on his way home for the first time since he fled from his brother. The blessing that he begins to seek God for is that the Lord would deal mercifully with him and give him favor and grace in the sight of his brother. And he, he is adamant. As you read the chapters leading up to this and the, the context of this scripture, almost every encounter he has with God, he's seeking God for this blessing. God, I want, I want fair. I want, you said you were going to deal kindly with me. God, God and, and this is the basis of his relationship with God. You, you said you were going to take it. You told me to go back, but, but I got to have favor in, in the sight of my brother. It would not only spare his life if he received this blessing. I mean, that'd be great. But it would also bring to pass all the, the other blessings that had been pronounced over him. See, the blessing he received at his father's hand and the birthright that he had taken from his brother, he didn't have possession of those things. Those blessings had been his. He had made the deal. He had stole the blessing, but he wasn't living in those blessings. This, this blessing, if he could just get God to do this thing, it, it would be the fulfillment of everything he had heard about so far. Typical of his nature, he tries to set this up on his own. He sends messengers of head in droves. Group after group, he starts sending them ahead to Esau. Go in and tell my brother I'm coming and, and, and let him know. See how he responds. So the first messenger comes back. He says, hey, good news. I found Esau. And, and he knows you're coming. And he says, oh, good. And he says, bad news. He's, he's on his way to meet you with 400 men. It, it doesn't look good. And so he starts to get groups of people. He had been blessed in the land that he was at. And he takes, he takes groups of servants and he gives them camels and he gives them donkeys and he gives them substance. And he starts to send them ahead one group after another saying, Here, here's a gift he saw from your brother Jacob. And, and he's trying to butter him up. He's trying to sweeten the deal. He thinks that somehow he can, he can again wiggle his way back in to no avail. No one comes back and says, hey, man, Esau, he, he's been pleased with all the gifts, and it's okay, you can, you can come on over. The more people he sends, the, the more alone he becomes. He continues to send droves ahead of him, trying to entreat Esau's kindness, and eventually he sent everyone and everything that he has ahead of him. And Jacob was left alone. And it was there in that time we read about the encounter he had with God. See, he had received a promise from God that if he returned, he would be safe. Despite the unusual or the usual schemes, it didn't appear like that was going to be the case. What he heard from God and what he seen in the flesh, they just didn't seem to line up. God said, go, go back. I'm going to deal kindly with you. And, and the servant said, Esau's coming with 400 men. Has anybody ever been there? God tells you one thing. And you think, that's great. That sounds wonderful. And then the messenger says, yeah, and by the way, you're going to die. <laughs> you know, God says he's going to bless you, and then you get laid off. We've, we've got this conflict, and, and Jacob's dealing with this. He's alone, and it says that there appeared a, a man that wrestled with him. And we know through the context of Scripture that this is, this is God there that's uh, a theophany, a rev, um, God revealing himself and moving in Jacob's life. And he, he wrestles with God throughout the night. God could not release the promise into the hands of a deceiver. The problem is God couldn't bless, he couldn't bless Jacob. Not the way that he wanted to. Not the way that Jacob wanted him to. He, God couldn't relinquish those kind of good things and blessings into the life of a deceiver. We read this verse and, and, and sometimes we're caught up in, in the story and we say, man, Jacob prevailed against God. What a guy. Jacob didn't, he didn't pin God down in the scripture. Okay, but when we read it, sometimes that's what it sounds like. He just kept on. He was just persevering. He just kept wrestling. And he, they just back and forth, back and forth through the night. And, and finally, finally God relinquished the blessing. But that's not what took place because what Jacob was wrestling for and what God was wrestling for were two totally different things. Jacob wanted that blessing. Jacob said, I'm not letting go until you bless me. 
I'm here for a blessing. I want a blessing. I'm, I'm not giving up. And he was persevering. The scripture says he prevailed. He, he didn't give up. He didn't stop short of what he wanted. But God was wrestling with Jacob to change who he was. God was after change in Jacob's life. So it's not like God, uh, God finally just got wore out and couldn't handle the strength of Jacob any longer. Jacob came to a place where he couldn't, he couldn't prevail against God. And the scripture that we read says he, he finally comes to a point where, where God has him and he says, what, what is your name? And Jacob still identified in that moment as, as Jacob. I'm, I'm the schemer, I'm the supplanter, I'm the liar, I'm the trickster. That, that's who I am, that's, that's what I do. God said, no longer are you going to be called Jacob. God said, I'm going to change who you are because God could not bless Jacob with the kind of blessing he was seeking after. There had to be a change in who he was. Now we're going to switch gears a little bit and look at Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. Now the Lord said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land I will show thee, and I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. That's a wonderful promise, isn't it? That's a great promise. But the promise wasn't without contingencies. God said, I, I've got something magnificent that I want to do in your life, Abraham. I want to bless you in such a way that the entire earth is blessed through your family. I'm going to do some great things in your life, but you've got to go. You've got to leave. I can't do it. I can't do it where you're at. I've told this story before, but it was a long time ago, so most of you have forgotten. Some of you haven't heard. The Bible says that, that God is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. And that's great. It's good to have good friends. Anybody grow up with friends that would have done anything for you? One or two. You probably had a couple friends that were always there. Well, me and some friends just like that were camping out one night at what we called the beaver pond. It was a pond down at the end of the road, and it was just all the trees were chewed off. It was a, just not a good place. It was swampy. It was nasty. And way over on the other side was a, a little hole that you could actually swim in. And there was no way to get there except for across the pond or you could go out our two-mile road. I don't know, what was Claiborne Road? Probably about five miles? Probably five miles down the highway and then there was another about two-mile dirt road that went in and that's where the little pond was. But we're camping. We're camping on the nasty side. So we got the bright idea, me and one other friend, there was four or five of us there, that we were going to take our, our boat across to the, the side that was nice. But our boat was a chunk of styrofoam that was probably three quarters of this piece of platform right here and about three inches thick. Seemed like a good idea at the time. So we got on there and we found some sticks and we were paddling and we paddled all the way across. It was a, it was a good sized pond. And we got over there and realized it wasn't really that much fun. It was too dark, too cold to swim. So we kick stuff around for a little while and then we decided it was time to go back and we got on our boat our chunk of styrofoam again and and we paddled about three times and boosh just big splash and wake and roll and so we turned around we paddled 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 back and we got on the land and we're like man what are we going to do now well I don't even know what this is so okay let, let's go we, we got back on we paddled about three times and Bloosh, big splash, the little things rolling around, we turn around, and I could just jump back onto shore because I was, I let him go first and I was in the back. And he paddled and got back off and, man, what are we going to, what is this thing? You know, we're convinced it's an alligator. I'm still to this day kind of, I think it was an alligator. But anyways, third time, man, what are, what are we going to do? We got, this is all we have to get back across here so we, we get back on the thing and this time we made it about one paddle and boosh, splash and the roll and the wake and so I just jumped on shore again and he jumps off this time and lands waist deep in the water and then he walked on water the rest of the way and got out of there and <laughs> and now he's soaking wet when we jumped off we the boat just you know when you jump this way the boat goes that way and now we're stuck so why? 
we're stuck. And our, our friends wanted to help us, but they couldn't do it. They couldn't help us because we had put ourselves in a place that they just couldn't get to. We had put ourselves into a situation where they just, they lacked the ability to bail us out. It would have been a great blessing if they would have had another boat, another way, but they, they couldn't do that. And, and sometimes we create these situations in life where we're saying, hey God, help! And God says, I want to, but I, I, I can't do that blessing there. And it's not his lack of ability. We know God's able, but he's not going to be unjust. And he's not going to bless us in a place that isn't worthy of blessing. And so, so we find ourselves stuck over there wondering what to do. The Lord reveals to Abraham here his desire to bless him in an incredible way. It's a blessing that will not only affect him, but his family. It will transcend and affect time and entire nations. However, God's desire to bless Abraham was held at bay by his current location. Abraham had to leave his place of comfort. He had to leave his place of familiarity. And his blessing was contingent upon that leaving. He had to leave the things that he knew best. He had to leave the areas that he was most comfortable, the behaviors that he was most comfortable. The security of knowing what was around the corner had to disappear in Abraham's life in order for the blessing to come. God could not bring to pass the full measure of the blessing as long as Abraham stayed there. He just, he just couldn't do it. Other times, he, sometimes he moves like he does in Abraham's life. He says, hey, Abraham, I got a blessing. I want to do something great in your life, and I need you to leave. And if we're smart, we step out of whatever area God's calling us out of, and we start to move. There are other times that God will just move us around. How many would like to have a dream like Joseph? God speaks to you and says, listen, all your brothers, are, they're going to bow down before you. I'm going to raise you up to a great level of honor. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make you something great, Joseph. And we say, that is awesome. And then we find out that, that God couldn't do that there. He tried to make, hey, hey guys, guess what? God told me that, that you're all going to bow down. And they hated him. It, it, it would have never taken place in that setting. His parents could have said, now children, your brother has a dream. You're going to bow down. Okay. Wait till they're not looking. And that's exactly what happened. Wait, to, wait till they're not looking. And so God takes Joseph and says, I, I gave you a dream, but I can't do it here. I've got I've to take you out of that place because I want to bless you. I want to do great things in your life, but I, I can't do it there. And there's a, there's a journey, there's a path that, that God takes Joseph on, and he ends up seeing the fulfillment of what God wants to do in his life. The, these two things come up time and time again through Scripture. We find Jesus dealing with these two situations over and over again. He wants to release greater levels of anointing and blessing on his people, but he first must deal with who or where they are. Abraham and Sarah, or I'm sorry, Abram and Sarai had to become Abraham and Sarah. Saul had to become Paul. Simon had to become Cephas or Peter. We constantly see God uh, approaching people who identify as one thing. And through his interaction with them, before he can release the great anointing, the great blessing, the, the things that they want to see come to pass in their life, the first thing he has to do is deal with who they are. And he changes who they are. And as they allow that change to take place, we see the blessing begin to follow. Moses was used mightily of God. But he had to be removed from his atmosphere first. He grew up in the palace of Pharaoh. He was found by the daughter of Pharaoh when Pharaoh wanted to kill all the Israelite children. And she had compassion on him and she took him in. And he grew up in comfort. He grew up in luxury. He grew up having everything he wanted. And then one day he realized that, number one, that wasn't who he was. He, he was an Israelite. He, he began to understand that. And God ordained situations that caused him to flee where he was. He had to be removed from that situation. Esther was comfortable in, in obscurity. 
She was okay just being in the background. And God said, no, I've got I've to call you out of that because I want you to do something. I want you to do something that's going to save my people. And she had to leave. She had to leave the comforts of home. She had to leave the comforts of, of, of being safe and secure and knowing exactly how everything was going to happen. And she had to go and live in a palace. Gideon went from hiding in a corner, threshing wheat, hiding from the Midianites to a place of prestige and, and a military leader. God wanted to do something in the life of Gideon, but he couldn't do it. He couldn't do it out behind the shed where nobody could see him. He had to come out of that. John Mark had to step out of a season of immaturity in his life and come into a place of accountability. And we see that he did extraordinary things on missionary journeys. But in the beginning, that wasn't how it was because he was dwelling in this place of immaturity. And he goes on his first missionary journey and he gets homesick and he just turns tail and runs home. Later in his life, he, he leaves that place and God uses him in a great way. If I could describe the mental picture that, that comes to mind when I was preparing and praying for this message, it's, it's that, that sometimes we pray and we pray and we pray for blessing. We're like Joseph. We wrestle and, and we just lock in with God and bless me, God. I want to I know more. I want to go further. I want to see greater revival. I need, I need greater blessings. I need financial blessing. I need health issues taken care of. And we're, we're locked in. And, and sometimes we, we get to a place where we see as if God is is outstretched his hand and he's holding us back and there's there's some reason that God doesn't want to release our blessing but the the picture that comes to mind if we could imagine the throne of heaven and God literally sitting on the edge of that throne just waiting for us to get to a point where we become who he wants us to be or get to a place where we get to where he wants us to be so that he can release those blessings God wants revival more than we want revival God wants lives restored more than we want to see lives restored. God wants backsliders to come home more than we want them to come home. It's not that he's holding back our blessings. It's that he's waiting for us to get to a place where we allow ourselves to be changed or we allow ourselves to step out of what we were and become what he wants us to be so that he can release those blessings. Because there's a certain level of blessings that God just can't release on us until we become who he needs us to be or we get to where he wants us to be. I believe God hears the prayers of his people and he's true to his word. And his word tells us if we pray on behalf of his kingdom from a pure heart that he'll hear us from heaven. He'll answer our prayers. He'll move on our behalf. Why is it then that we pray the same prayers over and over and over again without seeing the things we're praying for come to pass? It would do us good to consider both who we are and where we are. God can't bless them. For some, your identity is the very thing holding you back from your blessing. The easiest case of this to identify is sin. If you're living in sin, expecting God to bless you, he wants to bless you, he wants to help you, but he can't. He, can't, he cannot bless disobedience. He cannot bless arrogance and prideful behavior that says, God, I'm, I am who I am and I'm not going to change, but I expect you to move on my behalf. We say, God, I, I'm sick and tired of the, the struggle in my life. Why is things so hard? And, and we pray for peace and we pray for, for things to go well and we pray for finance and we pray for situations in our family. But, but God can't release things in our life because those are the only things causing us to cry out to him. If God answered all those prayers, we would forget all about him. And we, we find ourselves being someone that God can't bless. God loves sinners but he cannot endorse sin. And too many times people justify sinful behavior because they see the marginal blessings of God on their life. We see a, a hand of protection at times or, or we, we see God come through and do a, a small level of blessing and we say, well, I must be okay because God's still taking care of me. We come to church and we feel his presence and we say, see, see, God must be all right with what I'm doing because I, I still feel God. It feels good on Sunday, but we don't really see the blessings we're praying for come to pass. It's foolish to expect the favor of God if your identity is wrapped up in the things that oppose God. There are also those that are too prideful to be blessed. Like Jacob, we become accustomed to being able to do things our own way. We have our own resources, we make our own way, we always seem to, to get by, but sooner or later there's going to be a need that you cannot supply. Sooner or later 
There's going to be something that you long for, an anointing that you long for, a, a spiritual appetite that you develop that you, you cannot provide on your own. For others, our identity is dependent upon human relationships or social standing. These expectations, the expectations of these relationships determine how we allow God to move in our life. Because I'll allow God to move on me any way that doesn't affect my relationship with this person. I'll allow God to call me to any level of commitment that doesn't hinder my, my social standing with this group. Because we, we allow our identities to become so wrapped up in what others think and, and what other people expect of us that sometimes it limits, it limits the hand of God in our life. Still other identity issues arise from not understanding our proper place with Jesus. We fail to understand the authority that comes with who we are in Christ. Insecurities keep us from seeing the hand of God move like we want it to. Fear keeps us from pursuing the blessing that God has already made available. Sometimes God's already released things, but we're so insecure, we, we, we allow ourselves to doubt and to fear. And, and man, I want that. I want to I be able to do something great for God. I want to be able to, to really reach into my family, but I, I'm just so afraid to bring it up. I mean, if I bring that up at, at dinner, if I bring that up at Thanksgiving, if I, if I talk to my brother or sister about that, then, then our, our, our relationship's going to be fractured. Or, or because God's already moving on them and we don't realize it, but we're so afraid sometimes to bring it up. We're so insecure that God's really going to come through on his part that it causes us to freeze and, and just stay, stay who we are. The question is, can God, can God bless you? We're all seeking God for something. We're all after something. There's a desire that we all have. Whatever it is this morning that it is that you've been praying for, ask yourself the question, am I, am I someone God can bless that way? Consider the question, how do people describe you when they can't remember your name? Have you ever tried to tell somebody about somebody else and you couldn't remember their name? So you go into, oh, you know, you know it's that guy that, and there's a, there's a description that is placed on you. Well, consider and ask yourself the question, how do people describe you when they can't remember your name? And is that description something that qualifies for the blessing you're seeking? It's just a, a little tool for evaluation. Also, there are times that God can't bless us there. There are times we seek God for blessings that do not exist within the borders of our present location. Too many people live in the, the location of guilt. That's just where they live. They can't get past something that's already been done. They can't get over a, a past mistake or a, a, a lifestyle that they once lived. They live in this place of condemnation and guilt. And the greatest news is if you're living there before being baptized in Jesus' name, that's exciting that you guys are going to be baptized. That is great. Because you know what? When you're baptized in the name of Jesus, your past is completely washed away by the blood of Jesus Christ. And you, there's no reason to live into a place of guilt any longer. You're going to step out of some locations this morning. When you're baptized in the name of Jesus, what, what was done before, is that, that person is buried and dead and gone. So, so there's no need to live in guilt for, for those things any longer. But we as children of God do the same thing sometimes. Either it's something that happened before the blood, but, but we just keep going back and reaching to it, and we don't allow ourselves to get past it. Or maybe there was a mistake that was made after you were baptized in Jesus' name, after you were, you were made pure before God, and you've repented of it, and, and you've, you've been restored in the eyes of God. But in your heart, in your mind, that's where you live. That's the thing that you think about day in and day out. That's the thing that you go back to. You live in that place of guilt. And, and God can't bless you like you want him to until you leave that place. You've got you've to step out of that. I mentioned it a moment ago, but there's a place of fear that, that we create in our lives sometimes. We, 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 man, we want to do something. Man, we want to see God move. But, but we're, so, we're so afraid. 
We read the promises in God's word. We hear him talk to us in prayer. We know he wants to do something. We, we feel it. We sense it. There's such an energy of God moving. And, and, and all we got to do is step out and begin to pursue it. But, but man, I really like it here. Man, it's so comfortable. Abraham could have said, God, uh, um, how, how much of that blessing can I have here? Because maybe I'm okay with, with just a little bit of blessing. How, you know, I, I mean, I know where all the stores are. I know, what, I know the people when I'm walking down the street. And everybody knows who I am. And, and it, it's, it's just familiar. And, and I'm, I'm happy. And, and no, God said, I, I, can't, I can't bring to pass the thing that, that I want to do in your life where you're at. And we, we live there in that fear. We don't want to step into the, the unknown. We don't want to step out of what's familiar and what's always been. There's a place of isolation that we can create where we distance ourselves from people and we, we begin to distance ourselves from the, the people of God. I seen a quote uh, this week on Facebook and it said, people backslide by missing church for one good reason after another until it becomes a habit. You wonder, how is it that people who live for God, they, they love God, how do they, how do they backslide? Well, there was one good, man, I just, I can't make it because of this. And it's a valid reason. And then next week, oh, there's another valid reason. And then there's another valid, and, and maybe it started out with uh, an offense with a brother or sister. Or maybe it started out with just being tired or feeling overwhelmed. And, and so you just, there's one good reason after another. And the next thing you know, it's just, it's a habit to not go to church. And, and God can't bless us in a place of isolation. The scripture says how good and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. There's, there's power, there's synergy when we get together and start talking about, listen, this is what I want to see God do. Man, this is what I'm praying for. Let's pray together. Let's connect together. Let, let's work on this together. But the enemy wants us to be isolated. He wants us to, to just dwell in this place where it's just me. I don't want to open up. People will think I'm crazy if I tell them what God said. I can see Abraham saying, man, how am I going to explain to everybody that I'm leaving? Well, God said he was going to bless me, but, but I got to leave. God said he was going to bless me, but I, I, I can't be who I've always been. I'm, I'm changing simply because, and we hold these things in sometimes because we just know. We know that we know that if we tell anybody, they're going to think we're crazy. They're going to think we're foolish. When God's dealing with them about something and they're saying, man, if I tell anybody, they're going to think I'm crazy. If I start talking about the, the vision I have for my family, if I start talking about the goals I have spiritually, people are going to think I'm just nuts. And so we isolate ourselves. The longer we live for God, the more comfortable this life becomes. When you're new to God, living for God isn't all that comfortable because there's a lot of change. It's nice, it's good change, but it's not comfortable because there's a lot of change. But the longer we live for God, the more comfortable we become. The more comfortable we become, the more content we become. I'm, I'm happy with the way things are. I like this. The problem is the more content we become, the more complacent we're tempted to become. We don't pursue God like we used to. We don't really seek after him. We don't feel that urgency or dependency. And we, we create this place of of complacency. The supernatural does not exist in the land of complacency. Often we ask for things like greater revival. You know, we've heard the prophecies of doubling in a year and reaching this many souls and seeing this take place in, in families and this community being changed and we get really excited. We seek God and we pray for miracles, signs and wonders. We want to see supernatural deliverance take place. We want to see things that, that we can't explain happen. We want to see the flood of backsliders returning to the house of God. These are things that don't happen in the land of complacency. God can't pour out that blessing there. It doesn't exist there. Under the guise of faithfulness, we sometimes passively pray about things that should stir passion in our souls. You know, when the disciples asked Jesus to teach him how to pray... One of the first things he said is, uh, think not that you're going to be heard for your, your vain repetitions as the heathen. I'm 
completely paraphrasing that, but he said, don't think that you're, you're going to be heard from heaven just because you come with, with vain repetitions. And we liken that sometimes to, to times of prayer when we're going, oh, Jesus, 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 I love you, love you, love you, love you, Lord, I, I'm here, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. And those, those can be vain repetitions. But could the scripture also pertain to the things that we just kind of passively bring before God day in and day out? Sure, we're praying for the city, but it's just, oh God, what a big city we have. Give us revival, Lord. There's people everywhere. Cool. And we say, man, I'm praying for the city. I'm praying for God. Oh, thank you, Lord, for a good church. I'm just so grateful. Help us with any issues we may have. In Jesus' name. And we pray that every day. We pray that every time we pray. We're consistent in prayer. And I'm, I'm not bashing our faithfulness in prayer, but sometimes there, there should be things that stir passion, passion within our souls. Are we really hungry for the things we're praying for? Because God can't pour out that revival into just complacency. Because what happens is people start coming and we go, oh, thank you, Jesus. So many people are coming and good things are happening. And, but, but we're not active. We're not engaged. We're not ready for that. God tries to take us to, to another place. The disciples of Jesus experienced this very thing when they couldn't cast a demon out of a young girl. They were faithful. They followed Jesus. They had a relationship with him. They talked with him all the time. They were learning from him. And, and here they come across this demonic power and they're unable to deliver this girl. They, they lay hands on her. They pray and, and nothing happens. Jesus comes along and, and he performs the miracle and they say, why couldn't we do that? We want that blessing. Jesus said that blessing, it doesn't exist where you're at. See, that blessing, the, the blessing you're seeking, it, it, only, it only lives in a land of prayer and fasting. It only lives in a place where you're passionate about it and you're, you're desirous about it and you're seeking it fervently. You're willing to push away the plate and fast a little bit. You've got to come out of where you are that you're, you're getting comfortable where you're at and there's blessing where you're at. But if you want to see this happen, you're going to have to come over here. You're going to have to move from, from where you are. They weren't backslidden. They weren't dwelling in a place of sin. They were just living beneath that level of anointing. We, we always are seeking God for a greater level of anointing, greater level of, of things happening, greater level of blessing, greater level of provision. But our, our, our level of blessing is never going to be greater than our level of commitment. We say, man, and that was a great testimony this morning also. Do you know what? There, are, there could be people that are listening to me this morning that are saying, God, God, I want to know more about you. Teach me more about you, Lord. God, I, I want to know more. I, I love you so much. I, but, but at the same time, they're saying, I'm not doing that Thrive thing. I don't have time. Makes me get up too early in the morning. And the, the blessing you're seeking requires you to leave that place and say, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave this place of just being comfortable. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go over here. And because I want to know more about God, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be a part of the Thrive Club. I'm going to enroll in Search for Truth. And, and we got we to gotta leave that. We, we, we say, man, God, I'm, I'm so hungry to see X, Y, Z, co-worker, know more about you. Man, and, and, and we seek God for that blessing. We, we pray for them, but, but we never open our mouth. We never, we never step out of that, into that place that's uncomfortable and scary and say, hey, you know what? I've been praying for you. We never, we, we bypass the opportunities that come up to step in and interject truth and, and to begin to reach out with God's word to them because it's scary. We, we like it where we're at. We want to see God fall on us in a great, God, let me feel your presence like I haven't felt it in a year. Let me feel your presence like, like the first time I got the Holy Ghost, but we just worship the same way every Sunday. And, and God's saying, I, I want to. I want to move on you. I want to do something spectacular. I want to overwhelm you with my presence, but, but you're going to have to come out of that place of complacency, out of that place of comfort. You're going to have to step out into a, a new area, a new area of worship. You see, God was already pleased with the life of Abraham to a certain extent. God initiated the conversation. Abraham, hey, hey, Abraham, guess what? I got some stuff I want to do in your life. Where Abraham was wasn't bad for him. He, uh, God obviously seen something in Abraham's life that was commendable. Say, hey, man, I, I, want to do, I want to do more in your life. I want to go beyond where you are right now. Just, just, just come out of that place. I got a greater place for you. 
Even Jacob, we, we think about it as Jacob wrestling with God, but you know the scripture says there appeared a man that wrestled with him. God initiated that. Jacob, I, I got some change I got to work in your life. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to interact with you in a way that causes you to become something different, someone different. There are certain places and certain identities that we carry that God simply cannot bless. The good news is, the good news is, change is easier than we think. Jacob, if, if Tina, do you have uh, Genesis 32, 29? This is immediately after God changes who Jacob is. You're not Jacob any longer. And Jacob asked him, Tell me your name. What, who are you? Who are you? What, 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 what's going on here? Because change is confusing sometimes. And Jacob asked him and said, Tell me, I pray thee thy name. And he said, Wherefore is it that thou dost ask after my name? I said, that's, that's not your concern right now. And he blessed him there. The thing that he had been seeking for so long took place almost immediately after he allowed God to change who he was. It, like I say, God is, God is on the edge of his seat. Jesus wants to do the things that we're seeing, the supernatural. He wants miracles to happen in Grand Rapids. He wants miracles to happen in this altar and in your workplaces and in your families. God wants to do these things. We've just, we, he's just waiting for us to allow him to flip the switch and say, okay, I'm not going to be who I was anymore. I'm not going to be that person anymore. I'm going to let go of that identity and I'm going to become who you want me to be. And, and right away. And he blessed him there. And we could continue to read. He gets up and he makes his way across and, and here comes Esau with his great band of men. But it says that Esau, when, it, when he got there, he ran and he fell on and he braced him and there was a, a great reunion that took place. And there was restoration. But see, God couldn't, God couldn't deliver that in the hand of Jacob. He couldn't deliver that into the one that wasn't worthy of what he was seeking. You can stand. I'm going to come to a close. I believe God's heard the prayers for the miraculous. There are people praying for healing. People praying for deliverance. People praying for financial provision that they don't see any other way that is going to come to pass except for the hand of God. I believe that God has heard those prayers. I believe that God is able to answer those prayers. God can do the things you're asking about. They're not too big. They're not too scary. Furthermore, I believe God is willing to answer those prayers. He's, he's already moving things into place. Again, we, we talk about revival. Well, look around, guys. I pull in, I see new buses. I see new buses. I see things happening. God's, God's putting things into place. God's arranging things. Look, like I said, there's people I don't know. That's fantastic. Because God's arranging things. And He's getting them all into place. The question is, the question is, are we who we need to be? Can God release that blessing right now? The thing you're praying for. The miracle you're seeking for. Are you who you need to be? If you're new here, if you're visiting this morning, and you're seeking God for help, God, I realize my life's a mess. I, I realize things are messed up. And, and you say, no, I, I'm not who I need to be. That's why things are messed up. It's easy. It's easy to make your way to an altar and to raise your hands and say, God, this is messed up. And I don't want to be this anymore. And God says, okay, I can work with that. And he can change who you are. That's called repentance. And that, that person that you identify as, that person can be dealt with this morning. That person can pass right off the scene. But it's just as true for us who have lived for God for, for years and years. We can sometimes fall into identifying with things that aren't true. And we can come to a place this morning where we say, God, I recognize this morning I'm not really identifying as who you want me to. I recognize I've allowed maybe some things to creep in that aren't bad, but they're just not what you want from me. They're not what is required for the level of blessing that I'm seeking you for. And God can deal with that just as easy as he can with the sinner. Corporately, corporately as a church, 
are, are we, it's hard not to say we, I'm preaching, this is my last service here, but is river of life right now, is it who God needs it to be to release the great revival, the great blessings, the miracles, the, the apostolic revival that God wants to pour out in this city? Corporately, are, are, is River of Life that church? Are we where, as a church, are we where we need to be? Are we where we need to be or are we just, are we complacent? Are we comfortable? Are we okay? Are we content? Are we insecure? Are we fearful? Are we in a place that God can't pour out the blessing we're seeking Him for? These are questions I can't answer for anyone but myself this morning. Nobody else can answer. I, I, I don't know. I don't know if you, who you are and, and where you are. No one can know that. Brother Tim made a statement yesterday at men's breakfast about when you're all alone and you got time to really think about who you are. And that's, that's true. When, when nobody else is there, that's how Jacob was. When everybody else was gone, then God could really deal with who Jacob was. And he could bring change about. And he could work things there. This is, a, this is a personal thing. I would invite you this morning to step into an altar and begin to pray to seek God.